So, uh, we, uh, let me say a few things about myself and what brings me here. Um, I, um, you've heard of several words, theological words, we're in a chapel, this is a seminary, so let me uh, get out of the closet and say that I'm a theologian too, okay? <laughs> uh, what that means for me is that I, I am a sort of a glorified dream interpreter. You know, I work with people who are dreaming and help them to dream better. That's the work of a theologian. You know, whatever we think, whatever is deeper and deepest to our heart is the stuff that we work when we do theology. Okay. Um, and at TSR, we have realized uh, that some people live by dreams and hopes and expectations that are not life-giving. That our society is being run by structures of power that we might call colonial structures of power that are death dealing and people are dreaming about that so we need to dismantle those dreams and those hopes and help people to dream differently to have different expectations and hopes for the world so in a nutshell that's what i do okay at here at psr and this is a uh, part of what i want to invite you to do with us today here uh, so we have come together to think and learn, uh, and again dream about decolonizing social innovation. So perhaps uh, we should voice and name the assumption that goes with it, which is that there are colonial modes of doing social innovation. Right? I think if you are here, you sort of have an intuition that there are modes of doing social innovation that are... Uh, that one could call colonial. Uh, so innovative business practices, technological advancements, great ideas for a new startup, all these uh, categories are not immune from the, the appeal of colonial power. We have today, well, I'll soon invite uh, to the panel, a group of people who are dealing with social innovation and are perceiving and living through colonial mindsets and are trying to disrupt them. And so we might begin our reflections uh, by asking, what's the thing about colonialism? Haven't we overcome the colonial age? At least, you know, since the 40s, 50s, 60s, and through several movements for national liberation, our planet has gone through a process of post-colonization, perhaps, decolonizing itself. But why is it that we're still talking about colonialism? And what does it mean for us to talk about colonialism in the context of social innovation? So we may uh, be starting to see that colonialism uh, might be more insidious than we may think. So to, to speak uh, in parables for a minute, it might be useful to think of colonialism as a project that seeks to dominate earth, body, and spirit. Colonialism might be a, approached as a project to dominate earth, body, and spirit. So yes, uh, the initial assumptions that come to mind when we think about colonialism are most likely true. Yes, colonialism is largely about the historical seizing of power, land, resources, and people through violent means. It is the planting of a flag that claims a territory for a specific nation or group of people against the inhabitants of that land. It is also the ongoing social, political, economic infrastructure that upholds and perpetuates the seizures of power, land, resources, and people. It's still ongoing. Colonialism is largely about the expropriation of land and the imposition of a particular way of living on the earth and a particular mode of production. So it's all that, yes. But colonialism is also a regime that monitors and in fact colonizes bodies and spirits. That is that which we deem more personal, more perhaps deeper to ourselves. Colonial powers seek to control the multiplicity 
of bodily expressions and movements, to impose a certain worldview, a certain spiritual way of perceiving reality and constructing reality and living in the world. So we might think of colonialism also as a project that sought and continues to seek to colonize our very spirits, the very core of our existence, that which we consider deeper about ourselves. You notice why then it's important for me as a glorified interpreter of dreams to talk about colonialism? Because even the things that we dream and hope have been colonized. Let me give you an example. As a young boy, I was being raised in Brazil, where I come from, which is a country that has a long history with colonialism. I remember that I was sort of proud of being part of the third world. I was proud of that because I thought that the, the expression meant something like the Olympic Games. You know, it was the, the Olympic Games of world supremacy. And I was third, you know, which it's okay, it's bronze, right? Bronze medal. But I was like, yeah, almost there, I'm, you know, not winning, but still I'm on the podium, right? It's good. So why would I think? That's a, a key question for me. Uh, as I was growing up and realizing that third world meant something different, why would I think of global politics and geopolitical categories as a competition between nations? Why would I, and moreover, why would I be so glad for being third? What kind of mentality thinks of the world as divided by first, second, and third worlds? When we think like that, what kind of relationship do we build between the citizens of the first world and the citizens of the third world? And as someone who has lived in between and sometimes in these two different worlds, it has become clear to me that these categories are not innocent. They are politically charged. They communicate something and they communicate that in the global Olympics of power, some countries win and others lose. A colonial mentality is about the internalization of that logic. I have come to believe that. That it's just a matter of reality that some should lose. I have known that deep inside that I'm a third class citizen of the world. A person who understood this logic uh, quite deeply is the psychiatrist and the thinker Franz Fanon. He was raised in the French colony of Martinique in the Caribbean and always believed deeply that he was a French citizen until he moved to France and realized and started to be a victim of deep racism and prejudice. Fanon realized that he had black skin, but that he was given a white mask. And for a while he thought that the white mask would make him better, more intelligent, a true citizen of the first world. He internalized that mask at the expense of the blackness of his skin. What, he, what Fanon needed to do is, was eventually to decolonize himself even as he struggled to decolonize Algeria, where he eventually uh, moved to and started working and struggling uh, towards Algerian liberation against French colonialism. Right? So Fanon defined the process of decolonization, our task for today. He defined that as the substitution of one species of humankind by another. I'll repeat that. Colonization for Fanon is the substitution of one species of humankind by another. For Fanon, the very process of decolonizing the world, and we might add decolonizing social innovation, is what gives birth to a new person, to a new mode of being human. So today we're doing that as well. We're trying to think how to be human differently, how to be ourselves differently. So as we come together to think about decolonizing social innovation, 
we're thinking about the process of substituting a particular social innovator by another. We're seeking to recreate <coughs> ourselves as we recreate our society. To innovate on the social sphere is to innovate on the inner sphere. And here's some good news, I think. Decolonization is as old as colonization. Despite its insidiousness, colonial power never goes unchallenged. Communities have been resisting and reinventing themselves and the world for generations, for centuries, for millennia. So decolonizing social innovation is a reality that came into being the moment someone tried to colonize social innovation. Whether that's in art, in culture, in religion, in the sciences, and yes, also in social innovation, colonized communities have found ways to decolonize themselves and the world imposed on them. So if the colonial mindset is expand wide and big at all costs, we might think of decolonial innovators as those who expand deeper into the needs of a particular community. If colonial innovators operate under the logic of competition and the survival of the fittest, decolonial innovators will think with the logic of collaboration and partnership. If colonial innovators think that the earth is a resource to be explored, decolonial innovators will think of the planet as a living reality that needs to be nurtured. If colonial mindsets operate from the top down, we might move from the bottom up. If colonial innovators build wealth and prestige under the backs of marginalized communities, decolonial innovators will derive wisdom and insight from these marginalized communities themselves. So welcome to all of you decolonial innovators. Let's innovate differently. Let's think of social innovation with the accent of different worlds. Let's think of social innovation with those to whom innovation is a matter of survival. Let's think of social innovation with the communities that are already innovating. Let me transition and offer a special word of welcome to our three panelists uh, of this morning. Um, we have the privilege of welcoming uh, and learning from and being in dialogue with three of these decolonial innovators that are doing important work. Um, are they all here? I think so. Let me introduce them briefly uh, to our community here. Uh, we will hear from uh, Barney Kasim, who is the general partner at Dev Labs. Uh, she's a filmmaker and the corporate uh, storyteller at Dev Labs. She works with the startup teams to uplift the stories of users who have been transformed by their platform to create media strategies to win customers and to document the story of their startup to capture the imagination of uh, investors. I also, in the second place, want to introduce Brigitte Yarusso, uh, who is the founder and lead coach of Embrace Change. Um, Brigitte is committed to connecting and accelerating diverse, uh, purpose-driven entrepreneurs and business leaders so they can make a profit while being aligned with their purpose. Uh, her coaching and leadership development model is grounded in emotional intelligence, um, a strong lens around equity and inclusion, and a deep commitment to intercultural communication and collaboration. Uh, and Brigitte is just coming uh, back from a trip to Brazil, so she is glowing as you can see. That's what happens when you go to Brazil. <laughs> and finally, we have Daisy Osim, who is the executive director of Resilient Wellness. Uh, which is a nonprofit organization designed to address the prevailing cycles of intergenerational trauma in our communities, particularly in the healthcare sector. So please welcome uh, these three figures. Uh, they will join us here.